Hello everyone. Before we dig into our text today, let me give you a couple of updates. The other day I was cleaning my yard from some of the limbs which had fallen after the heavy winds that we had lately. I rounded my shed and what do you think I found? <laughs> yeah, my ladder. That's right, my ladder was there placed over the fence by my neighbor. I continued working, picking up limbs and carrying them to the front yard. It was there that I noticed that my neighbor was working on a couple of his pickup trucks. So I went and retrieved the ladder and gave it to my neighbor. Because of your generosity, I paid it forward. So thank you, Lakoma, for being such an example to me. Okay, so here's, here's the next update. Two weeks ago, <laughs> I said that we would take three weeks to cover the Lord's Prayer. I changed my mind. Uh, see, the more I dig into this beautiful poem, the richer it becomes. So I'm going to stretch this prayer further. There's just so much here. I mean, I mean, it's a treasure waiting to be discovered. And so, and as I told you many, many weeks ago, I, I just, I just don't want us to rush through the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, we'll end the series when it ends, and I believe it, it deserves our full attention. These are, these are Jesus' words of kingdom living, how we're to live and think and behave in this new kingdom Jesus came to establish. So, let's, let's enjoy the ride and uncover the treasure which wait. Okay, so now let's dig into our topic today. This is a season of eating. It is, is it not? I mean, from Thanksgiving to New Year's Day, we often consume more in a day than we ought. Anybody with me? And after the first of the year, commercials were turned to weight loss and equipment guaranteed to shed those extra pounds. And many of us will set goals determined to lose those unwanted pounds to get healthy, to do better about that which we put in our mouths. Now on the flip side of that, Many will also determine to increase their sustenance of God's Word, determined to read through the Bible in a year, even if it means trudging through the Levitical laws and the poems of the prophet, which, which are hard to digest. It's a desire to feed oneself with that which is truly important. Now, it's a, it's a daunting task, and many of us have failed at both endeavors, have we not? As we continue our in-depth study of the Lord's Prayer, I, I want to read through the prayer again before we concentrate on one little verse this morning, just one little verse. Here it is. Pray then like this. Our Heavenly Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So our verse today is verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. When I think of this verse, it's a simple request, is it not? Lord, please give me the daily sustenance I need to live. Fuel for this body you have given me. Now, for many in this world, this prayer is repeated daily. The, those who are food deprived are, are numerous. E even here in Mustang, our little food pantry, our food closet really, is used. It's a lifeline for a few guests. And for others who have an unexpected disruption in their life, it's salvation in a time of great uncertainty. The little phrase, give us this day our daily bread, helps us realize just how appreciative we ought to be of the daily blessings we've been granted by our Heavenly Father. Many of us have never gone hungry. We've never been without. Our stores are always packed with what we need. And in the event, in the event we go through a pandemic and there is an individual who can't get the brand of peanut butter he desires, we often whine and get a little upset even if the pantry is full of all types of food. We're blessed, are we not? 
I wonder if we give God the thanks he deserves. I, I wonder if we truly appreciate how he has blessed us. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Let me ask you a question. Is there a story in scripture where God provided daily bread? I mean, do you remember a time when God sustained many people with sweet wafers? <laughs> I know you do. It's, it's a story of the children of Israel as they wandered in the desert and in the wilderness for 40 years. Seven days a week, God provided manna, bread from heaven. Look at this verse. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. So let me ask you, what was the test? No, no, really. What was the test? All right, here it is. Would they listen and be satisfied with that which God provided? That was the test. Would they listen and be satisfied with that which God provided? Now, now remember, this bread of heaven supplied everyone's needs. No one went hungry. There was, there was no need for a food pantry. God supplied all their needs. And yet, yet, many were not satisfied with that which God provided. Does that sound familiar? I have clothing. I have shelter. I have food. It is enough, is it not? For most of us, no, we want more, right? I mean, so we, we acquire as much as possible. We hoard the Kleenexes, we hoard the toilet paper, we hoard the peanut butter. Is not this a product of an untrusting heart? Listen to the words in the Psalms, which speaks to this event in the wilderness. They did not believe in God and did not trust his saving power. For many years, I believe the only item the children of Israel ate during those 40 years was sweet wafers. <laughs> For 40 years, they ate only the manna which fell from the sky. That's, that's what I believed. And then I began to think, if they only had manna, where did all the animals come from for their sacrifices? The bulls, the goats, the sheep during their, those 40 years. The portion which was given to the priest and the portion they were to eat. Exodus 12, 38 speaks of this mixed multitude coming out of Egypt and bringing with him much, very much livestock, both flocks and herds. So did some hoard their flocks while others had none? Were people stingy, not willing to share? Was loving, was loving your neighbor a thing at that time? I mean, listen to this verse. Yet they sinned still more against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the wilderness? What were they missing? Were they not supplied with everything they needed to sustain life? Was not God taking care of them? Hmm. You know, we gather some insight into the hearts from the book of Numbers. We read, we remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. The food in Egypt cost nothing. It was there for their taking. They had fish, they had all sorts of vegetables, had no cost to them, and now they're stuck eating these sweet wafers day in and day out. How many of you have ever eaten a food so often that it almost made you sick? Probably most of us have. The children of Israel complained about that which God provided because it was the same wafer over and over for 40 years. So how would you respond to this test? I can tell you manna was a simple test for which most of the children of Israel failed. 
There the Lord God made them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. All right, here's another question. Do you think God still tests our hearts today when it comes to our daily provisions? What do you think? I believe the answer is yes, absolutely. Yes, when it comes to our daily provisions, I believe God places tests in front of us as opportunities. All right, let me give you let me give you two reasons. First, tests show God what is truly in our hearts. With that which God has provided you, are you grateful? Are, I mean, are you grateful? When I look around, I see a society of not enough, a society that wants more and demands more, craving like those in the wilderness. And the biggest test, we want whatever it is, our way. We want it our way. I want fish. I want vegetables. We demand a world fashioned to our needs and our wants. God blessed the children of Israel with food from heaven in a wilderness to keep them healthy and well-fed. And many were not satisfied. They wanted more. They wanted something different. How many of us would begrudge that which was forced upon us? Anyone? The test of this nature goes right to the depth of our hearts and identifies the motives which are often hidden. Yet it is in those moments when our true nature, either our fleshly nature or our spiritual nature, is visible for all to see. And what is really sad, what is really sad is most of us, when that fleshly nature shows up in these tests, we will never recognize it in ourselves. We're so intent in demanding our own way, we become blind to the failings of our own heart. I know, I've been there. And if we question and balk at every authoritarian voice in our lives, are we really satisfied with our daily bread from heaven? Does not our craving for autonomy become the answer to this test? We would rather listen to our voice than the voice of God. No one's going to tell me what to eat. Brothers and sisters, these tests we face daily and sometimes on an hourly basis are gifts we can give to God. Tests are gifts we can give to God. When faced with hunger, when faced with uncertainty, when faced with pain, when, when faced with suffering, the greatest gift we can give our Heavenly Father is the gift of our trust, our faith in Him. We listen. We obey, we trust, even during dark and confusing times, we place our faith and our hope in one who sustains us with his daily bread, do we not? Okay, there's another reason I believe God places these opportunities, these tests in front of us. It's so we can learn a new lesson from God. Test our opportunities to learn a new lesson from God. Our, our Heavenly Father, is shaping us and molding us, forming us into an image bearer of Christ. And it takes time. And it's not easy, is it? It's also a lot of work on God's part because we're stubborn, or I'm stubborn. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, there was a sourdough craze. You can make your own sourdough bread, but first you must create a starter. A starter which can be passed down from one bread to the next. Now, Deborah tried this and she was frustrated at first. Everything she tried did not work. Every Instagram explanation, ex whatever that is, on creating a starter, it failed. They made it look so easy. It wasn't. I can remember her showing me the jar when the starter finally worked and it doubled in size, after two or three weeks of trying, she did it. But it's called a starter for a reason. <clears throat> and the starter 
It's just the beginning. It's the kick the flower needs to grow and produce. So what comes next? If one's going to produce good bread, the bread demands kneading and letting it rise, kneading and letting it rise, kneading and letting it rise. I can remember the first batch of bread ever shaped and then baked. It was so good. It took hours. It took really days, weeks of frustration. And in the end, the product was yummy bread. And I often wonder how many times God must need us, reshape us, allow us to rise before we produce a batch of yummy bread. Personally, I'm glad he's still working on me. I'm not where I want to be, but I'm so grateful I'm not where I used to be. Also, tests are God's gift to us. Tests are where we grow. Tests are where we mature. As Paul said in his first letter to the Corinthians, it's in the fire where one's work will be made manifest. But James, you may say, what, what, what do tests have to do with our daily supply of bread? Are you not getting off track and going down a side road for which this prayer was never intended? Is this not simply a reminder to be grateful for the food God has supplied us with? Good question. Can I ask you one back? Do, do you think Jesus had more in mind than just physical bread which would sustain us? Do you think there is something Jesus is requesting here, which is on a spiritual level, something else we desperately need daily for life? Okay, look at this passage. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Doesn't Jesus repeat those words? I mean, come on. Where, where, does, where does Jesus repeat those words? What, what was happening when Jesus used those words as a defense against the powers of darkness? I mean, was he not being tempted by the devil to turn these stones into loaves of bread after 40 days of fasting? And we all remember what he said. It is written. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Brothers and sisters, we need daily bread to sustain us physically, but we also need bread to sustain, to, to sustain us spiritually. And I'm worried that many of us have a very limited diet of this spiritual bread. We eat bread sporadically, and we wonder why we are weak when the temptations of Satan are upon us. It is in this bread where we hear the voice of God. It's in this bread where we gain eternal life. Listen to this. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Brothers and sisters, there is a craving which must exist in our lives if we're going to be shaped into the image of Christ. A craving for the bread of life. I can either crave the pleasures of this world or I can crave the treasures of God. I have a choice. You have a choice. A choice leads to death and one choice leads to life. Listen to this verse. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. And whoever does the will of God abides forever. Okay, right now we're living between the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of heaven. And I don't know about you, but I daily feel the tug of both. <clears throat> and if you remember the sermon last week, the kingdom of heaven is here now. As children of God, as subjects of his kingdom, we are to expand his kingdom in this place. And that's not easy. And it will never be accomplished if we do not have a daily diet 
a bread that sustains us, capital B. We live in an arena where two kingdoms are vying for our time and our attention. We know the kingdom which brings life. We know the kingdom which brings hope and grace and love. And even the gates of hell will not prevail against this kingdom. And it's my hope this is the desire of your heart. This daily dose of bread, this prayer time, which our Lord is a treasure waiting to be discovered. I love Proverbs chapter 2 and 3. I go back to it almost weekly to help and even meditate on the words, to help me refocus my life and to remind me of that which I should be craving. Listen, my son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom, inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So what strikes you in this passage? I highlighted some of them. Look, Take a look at it again. Treasure up, making your ear attentive, incline your heart, call out, raise your voice, seek it, search for it. What happens when we do this? What happens? We understand. We have this awesome awareness of our Lord, our Father, our God. We get Him. We partake in him and find him and we grow the bread which comes down from heaven. When digested leads us to the knowledge of God. Brothers and sisters, we're to consume the greatest treasure ever, the bread of life. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the word. Jesus spoke the very words of God. Jesus was in the beginning. Every word was, that was spoken on Mount Sinai was Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I believe two components are necessary for one to grow spiritually. Mike and I spoke about this in our Tassels podcast, and I mentioned it briefly in my sermon two weeks ago. These are not only components, they are, there are others, but if one desires to grow in their walk with God, these two components are necessary ingredients for one to develop into mature believers. And Jesus touches on both. He says this, pray then like this and give us this day our daily bread. Two components, two components right here. Prayer and the daily consumption of bread, bread with a capital B, again, meaning we consume Jesus, his words. We read and listen to the words of Jesus, the words of God. I love what Job says. I have not departed from the commandments of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my portion of food. Have we done the same? Let me leave you with a couple of thoughts. In Frisco, Texas, where I lived for six years on Main and Third Street was a small gas station that had an incredible cafe attached, it, which has nothing to do with the story. But, but, but it, it was on this corner, <laughs> corner where men stood for daily work. If you needed some guys to do some hard lifting, these were the ones you turned to. So when the pickups came and and to the site, people, those guys would gather around and then they would jump in the cab and they were off. Each day, the same men were there, waiting to be chosen, waiting for an opportunity. Sometimes they were chosen, other days, no work was needed. Each day they waited and waited, willing to work to fulfill the need of their daily boss. Each of them hoping, trusting, and expecting to gain work, to be fed and to help them with their empty stomachs. All they wanted was enough, just enough, to get by for that day. So what if? What if we cultivated the mindset of a daily worker, one who daily worked for food from God, manna, the bread of heaven? Every day we place ourselves on the corner of faith and hope, willing to work, waiting on God to provide just enough. Could we? Would we? See, I've noticed three states of being in this world, three types of 
personalities, the way individuals function. I'm sure there's many more, but let me, let me give you these three off the top of my head. The first state of being in this world are those that are trusting. They place their faith in their Heavenly Father to sustain them. They look to Him for guidance and sustenance. They trust their Heavenly Father will take care of them and they rely on Him. And I see this state in many of you. Okay, the second one, second state of being are the accumulators. They believe in God, but they're not sure He will provide. So they collect, they hoard, they store up and become stingy with their possessions. There's a lack of trust. It's a, it's a mentality of pulling one up, oneself up from their bootstraps. I, I don't need anyone else to help me. It's pride and some arrogance mixed in, is it not? Who do you know that might be an accumulator? Here's the third state of being. It's the sluggard, the slothful. This is the one who goes through life aimlessly without focus. And often these are those who say, you owe me. There's no direction, no focus. And they often wonder why they don't have a stronger faith. Their desire may be there, but the discipline's not. Anyone know someone like that? I want to end this morning with a verse from Proverbs, an appeal for one's soul. I would hope it would be a request from you this moment, a moment of repentance, or a moment of reflection, a prayer to your Heavenly Father. Dear God, remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. Lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or at least I be poor and still and profane the name of my God. So, how will you approach this new year in a couple of weeks? Do you have any thoughts as to how you you will make the bread of heaven your daily sustenance. And if, and if you find yourself being shaped and molded by God, which all of us do from time to time, give him thanks. Count it as an honor, a gift, to know that God loves you so much that he tests your faith as you trust in him. Deb and I will be gone the next two Sundays. Mike and Austin will take over, and we pray God riches blessings on each of you during this holiday season. You mean so much to us, and we love you very much. May our Father bring you peace and joy. And may the foundation of your life be built on the bread of life, the bread which came down from heaven and saved our souls. May his face shine upon you. Until we meet again, may God bless you.